Every Wednesday on the health segment, we come your way with some updates on COVID-19. And we get to speak to people who have experienced the virus and um, in most cases have recovered. Remember uh, a few weeks ago, we spoke to a 95-year-old man who was so elated because he recovered. Well, today's story is a little different. He has recovered, thanks to God, but he's about to tell us how uh, his whole community stigmatized him because of how his situation was handled. By the way, we have Dr. Emmanuel Amankra. He's in the studios with us, our resident doctor for Wednesdays. <laughs> and uh, he is the lead at the Lekma Isolation Center. Good morning Good and morning, welcome. Bella. Thank you. Let's listen to Joe. Uh, he's joining us via phone. He's going to tell us his story. And so um, I hope that this inspires you some way, somehow. But also, we're sending a message to the Ghana Health Service so they can better handle the situation. So good morning, Joe. Hello? Joe, good morning. Hello? Hello, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm fine. It's good to hear from you this morning. And I'm told you have fully recovered. Yes, yes, yes. We thank, thank God. We thank God. But tell us your story from the beginning. At what point did you realize or were you confirmed as a COVID-19 patient? Um, actually, I just don't have any idea about how I got it. But to my respect, I realized one morning at my work time, I was busy at the office. So all of a sudden, I just telling myself, I was, I was, I wasn't looking at my, myself, I was stressing, mm. and, then, and then I was coughing at the same time. Okay. I was a bit, I was a bit different altogether. Okay. So, I knew mean, the challenge it, it can happen more to like uh, an hour and 30 minutes, then you facing those challenges. Okay. So, so I was, I was, I was like, ah, what is this? Hmm. Okay, yeah. carry on. So what is this? Okay, so when you noticed that you weren't feeling well, what happened? Did you go to the hospital? No, I didn't go to the hospital. I, I just took the day at work and then I went back home. And then I, 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 I was about to sleep. I was about to sleep. If I was going that night, I couldn't sleep. Mm. I I never sleep that night. I was I was sweating. I was coughing. Mm. It's more or less like something in my throat that I, I'm I'm willing to vomit, but I can't vomit. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I was I was really really coughing that night. So if you couldn't sleep that night, I, by morning, what did you do? Uh, by morning it was okay. So I I I get the website again and I was complaining to my mind that I didn't get here I'm having. Mm. So we, we got checked and he was like, hey, Nami could you see? What did he say? Nyamin yeah. yede. Maminko mechi. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me go back. Uh-huh. Because of the way how I was explaining my experience to him. Mm. I was just a second. And like, hey, then let me move back. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, an ambulance was around my website and then they came to see me that um, they are having information about uh, uh, one or two taxi drivers and then they wanted to do a mass testing on the website. Okay. Yeah, so I do not know, that is that the last moment I'm having there. Okay, so... so they, they, I was the first person to run the test. Mm -hmm. so the way I was explaining myself to them, they just realized maybe it's the COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after the test, they came back to the website again and then they were like, we want to talk to the manager. We are interviewing the manager to them. And then yeah. it happens to be me. Okay. It happens to be me. So they said I should go home. And then they 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 send my information, my everything to the uh the one okay. to the new one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you so, went home for them to come and pick yeah. you up? 
How long before you move on, how long did it take for your results to come? Oh, probably like um four days, I think four days. Four days? Yeah. All those four days you were still at work. Yeah, I was still at work. But you weren't wearing a uh, nose mask because you didn't know if you had COVID, right? Yeah, you know, so because of uh, the the other community was telling about how the experience you have and then you have to move to the COVID. I I was I was I knew I knew that all this was is COVID. Okay. So I knew how I knew how I associate myself with others. Okay. But by you know, I read the update and then protect myself. How do you move mask? Okay. And I make okay. Sure, I make sure I don't get this to anyone. All right. So so when you went home, how long did it take for them to pick you up and tell us what that experience was like? Yeah, I was, I I remember the time we I knew we were in it in it for I knew we were from anyone. And then the second day was Saturday morning. Saturday morning, I was washing. And then, while I was washing, I was sweating. And then the same time, I was coughing. Mm -hmm. So I realized it, it was getting serious. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was calling the uh, emergency number one, two, three, no response. Mm -hmm. So I called the manager again. I, I said, uh, I can't say. I can't show my myself so well. Mm. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it just happened. I can't do. Uh -huh. I can't do. I can't do. And then it's more or less like I, I feel like vomiting. I can't do anything. Okay. And then, okay. You you need to pace yeah. up. Okay. So so at that point. I mean, you said you called your manager. Did he call the ambulance? What happened? Yeah, you, you were calling, but all of a sudden, you knew before. So okay. you just, and then uh, you were like, he's coming to take me to the hospital. Okay. So I, so I should move. Mm. So he came, he came to my place and then took me in the car. So we were going and then the car took And then he told them, he was me to the hospital. Uh -huh. And then they said, they said, no, they have sent my emotion to the ambulance, then the ambulance will come to me. Okay. So, you, you, you came back to the house, uh -huh. and then we were like, okay, he's going back to the rest, I did everything, I should call, I should call him. Mm. So, they, they called me in the ambulance, I mean, I found you before the, the, the person's name. Okay. And like, Michael. Mm. Okay, you do this, then you, 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 you call me back, and then you, you take me to the house. Mm. And I was like, okay. So they said I should pack one of my suitcases and then leave. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was outside doing things, and then uh, all of all of a sudden I did hear uh, uh, an ambulance coming. But I knew, mm. I knew, I knew where the ambulance was coming to. Me. I knew, I had no idea the ambulance was coming. Okay. The next, the next call I came to was like. Michael, you will be you at your end shortly. But like, ah. But then I was outside. Mm. You will be too shortly. But then it's not like you were dropping. I didn't know, I didn't know about it. Okay. So, the time was off. And then, I was like, I ah, hope okay, then it's not me. It's not me. The next thing to come was the call. And then I was like, Michael, you are just me to. Where are you? So it's not like I just turned myself and then I saw the ambulance. So I stopped, I stopped the ambulance and then the driver was like, you are coming. Like, you are here, like, you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when you turn, you, 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 you want to send up my, my, my mother to where okay. my mother is. Uh-huh. In front of my mother. That was where they turned their friend. And then, no, no, like, when they turn, and they were, they are coming to me. They are they are building crowd outside. Anyone was coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Ah, I'm like ah, Charlie, so this ambulance. And they were yeah. coming for you. Yeah. So I'm and sure that by the time, was, by the I time, was, yeah.
and one of outside of them, we are, we are really suspicious. We want to see who the ambulance is coming to pay. Okay. So I was standing in front of a container. I didn't know what to do, but I didn't, I didn't know how they are going to pay. Yeah. Anyway, so, so that means that everybody in the community knew at that point that you had COVID-19. I can imagine uh, how yeah, you yeah, felt. Yeah, 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 but once we tell the ambulance, that was when we realized someone in the community had has it. And yeah. eventually it was you. Okay, so fast forward. Yeah. Let's, let's rush this through. So when you got to the hospital, how long did you spend in the isolation center? Uh, I spent um, one, one week. One, one week. I spent one week. And I'm told that you actually got into the ICU because your situation was quite severe. Yeah, yeah, I was at the ICU. For that entire uh, week? I, I was at the ICU for uh, three weeks. For three days, yes, okay. Yes, when, 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 when I, I was in the ambulance and then I got to the hospital, the hospital was for me, they were like, they, were like, they have to stay me, they have to stay me before I go to the ICU. Mm. So, so they took off the hospital and then I couldn't move. So all that I did not was like, I did not have a doctor to me, and then I had an OP for me, OP, my family. Oh. That's yeah, sad. So I, I was, I was on that moment. The next thing I realized, like, I was, I was, I was on the IC. Okay. Uh, you've recovered now. Final yeah. question before I let you go. So, coming back into society, how have the same people in that community treated you? Oh, it's really, really, really bad. It's, it's really bad. bad? It's really bad. Please. I, before, before I, 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 I went to the hospital. Everyone who went to get to my family. And then my mom especially was crying all the way. Okay. Wow. That's yes. sad. So, yes. It's so sad. Anyway, I, I hope that things get better. But thank you so much for sharing your story um, with us. And that's, um, you know, one of the COVID-19 patients who has now recovered. But his concern was how he was picked up by the health officials. This was an ambulance, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was all noise because yeah. everybody eventually got to find out that he was the one. And this is something that we've been talking about that leads to stigmatization because of how cases are managed. Why is that so? I believe that, once again, it boils down to the education about it because people still don't know. I think it's a bit better now in some areas, but we still have a lot of work to do. Mm. And sadly, even in the corporate sector, the educated people... We have a huge work to do there because they also stigmatize from bosses to subordinates and also colleagues as well. But can you blame a society for stigmatizing if the ambulance picking you up is already, you know, making so much noise? It's like we're announcing that there's a COVID-19 patient in your community. Already there's fear attached to COVID-19. And so if the health officials who are supposed to protect us are coming with all the noise, then obviously they're telling us that there's a problem here, there's a red light here, and you all should beware. How is that our fault then if, um, you know, indirectly we stigmatize? So the thing is, um, there are two sides to this thing. They have to rush to him because he's not able to breathe. He needs oxygen as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So then within the shortest possible time, you have to get to the patient. Now, the shortest time to get there is with the sirens. That is when everyone can give you away because on the roads, if you just move without the siren and no one would actually give you that space mm. so with the sirens they told him within 10 minutes they are going to get there now here's the case an emergency so the life of the person goes paramount to everything else usually if the person is stable you can arrange a meeting ground yeah. where the person can meet them and then you pick them up mm -hmm. but here's the case the call they got was the person was not stable he wasn't able to breathe so we already know that his oxygen his is danger. already down. He yeah. needs oxygen as soon as possible. Or the news can be something different. Hmm. That, that's serious. But at the same time, if this is happening, shouldn't there be a follow-up psychologist to at least speak to the people in the community? Because I know that there's usually a psychologist for the patient. But what about the people in that area? Because then, unfortunately, they're still going to stigmatize, no matter how hard they try. So part of the GHS structure, we have community... Um, psychiatrist or community psychiatrists and then these community nurses who also daily go into the community to talk to them about the um, COVID-19. Are they doing it? They are doing it but the effectivity of it is the problem because people actually are believing 
people are believing what they want to believe. Mm -hmm. They are going out there, they are talking, they are talking, but then are they making that effect that we want them to make? That is a big problem. Because even mm -hmm. as of now, you talk to people who are educated, people who are who, who are elites, in mm -hmm. quote, that you think they are well-read about, they, they know about these things. But still, they also have all these issues with stigmatizations as well. You talk to someone and they go to work and people don't only want to talk to them because they've recovered. Yeah. People don't want to have any association with them because they've recovered. Yeah. And a whole lot of um, things that people are doing out of fear. And, and yesterday we received a message and this also indicated that there was someone who caught the virus recovered but unfortunately even his boss is asking him to go back home and wait for a while <laughs> and so like you're saying the educated people who unfortunately are stigmatizing against some of these people but it's also because people are scared of catching the virus exactly you can't blame them can you fear as i say we, we can't blame them but for um the people like that usually once you are um discharged you're given a letter a discharge letter which states that you are cleared to work and everything mm. so that you can take it to your HR or your boss or whoever demands or wants to see it okay. to be sure that the um, workplace is safe. Now, I want to ask you this question. This was a message that came in from an anonymous texter yesterday that said that some of us have been in contact, have been contact traced. We turned out positive and were asked to stay home. No test conducted on my immediate family, which is my husband and two kids. I was given prescription on WhatsApp, which I bought and I'm still taking. Now, are we part of the discharge or recoveries, or are we active cases? So, um, first of all, if you are asymptomatic, meaning that they had no symptoms at all, from the first day they tested to the 14th day, mm. that is when they will be deemed as discharged. And they will be contacted as well that this period, you are, you're discharged from isolation. No, wait, come again. So, if I've tested positive today? Yes. Between today and the 14th day? When we day, took your sample. Yeah. If we took a sample today, mm -hmm. good, and then you, are, you have no signs, no symptoms at all, according to the GHS protocol, in 14 days, you are cleared. You mean after 14 days? After I'm 14 cleared. days, yes, okay. after 14 days. So the first 14 days, I am an active case? Yes, so you are in isolation. That's when you do your isolation and the self-quarantine and everything. But in her case where there was no follow-up test, because in the past we were doing double tests, now we're not doing that now anymore. Now we're not doing the follow-up test. But then in her case, let's just say that it was at the time when they were doing double tests. And unfortunately, she was asymptomatic and so she stayed at home. And there hasn't been any follow-up test to indicate whether she's negative now. During the time we're doing a double test, and usually you'll be called in okay. for a second test. Okay. When, um, for that, they were doing it. But when the protocol changed, that is when you are not being called in for a second test, but you'll be, conf or you'll be told mm -hmm. that um, it's been two weeks. So according to the new guidelines, you are free, you've been released from isolation, and you're discharged. So, yeah. But previously, you'll be called in for the second test, and you wait for the results and because of the load sometimes other people can be in isolation for about a month mm -hmm. waiting for the results yeah. even though we know they have recovered but we, they still have to wait for the results before they can be discharged out of isolation the who protocol also indicated that it was not absolute when they said that asymptomatic patients after 10 days or 14 days were not necessarily going to transmit the virus mm -hmm. and so there would be cases where the, there might be people who may be asymptomatic but they still might transmit the virus after 10 or 14 days. Well, right? it's not absolute. It's not 100%. But then from the research that they made, they actually pegged it at 10 days. But mm -hmm. for the GHS, we made it 14, 14 days. Exactly. Just to add on to an extra safe. And then if you're symptomatic, uh, if you're symptomatic after the 14 days, three days after you are asymptomatic as well. So not just the 14 days, but when you are asymptomatic. But what if I'm still shedding the virus? What if I'm still transmitting the virus and infecting other people even after the 14 days? So the thing is with every virus, there's an infectivity period. Okay. Every infection, there, there are viral infection or communicable diseases that are the infectivity period. Mm. So with the research so far that they've done, that is what they've come up with. That okay. the infectivity period is that time and afterwards, probability less of you likely. less likely to actually infect okay. others. I actually have this particular lady whose story I read right now on the phone with us and so she'll give us details hello good morning hello good morning thank you for joining us on tv3 new day so you said you tested positive um at a point can you tell us when exactly this happened hello hello hi can you hear me yes please okay so you're saying that um uh, there was some contact tracing being done and you tested yes. positive when did this happen it happened about two or three, three weeks back at my office. Three weeks I ago? Yes. Okay. I was at some nursing home, but I've been in the house. But when I report better, I will report it. 
Okay. 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 Can you just reduce the volume on your TV set because it's giving us feedback, making it very difficult for us to hear you? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So this is a woman who says that she tested positive uh, from contact tracing. Um, asked to stay at home, and her family members were not tested, um, you know, but she was yes. also given prescription. So she's back on the line. Hello? Hello. Yes, so you were saying? Yes, it's not as I was saying. I was, my, we did the test on a Tuesday, and by Saturday, the results were negative. Okay. And then the following day, Monday, I was tested again. She called me. Mm. And then, and then was well, just having a normal test and was like, oh, am I sure? Did I take the test? And I said, I took it. Would I like to have the result? And I said, that no. Mm. Even though I was sick, but I've recovered now. There's nothing wrong for me to know my status at the COVID. So she said, okay, but I'm perfect. It's not a no problem. So she took me the test and was like, wow. Because you <laughs> At my office, it's like I'm, I'm an uh, advocate for this protocol. Mm. And I take part in all the protocols. I make sure that everybody that enters my office is in the treatment. You use the hand and the yeah. You don't yeah. touch the door. The only thing is, like, it came as a big shock to me, which I did not understand in the first place. But I got this courage now that I know. It's unprecedented. I need to take my medication. But I'm so glad you did Okay. So we kept we kept chatting on the on WhatsApp, and she was like, hey, "My residence is outside our limits of our district. Mm. Like I work at Kaswa, but that, um, I'm living in Kaswa, but I work at Accra." Okay. And she was like, "Okay." Then she will hand me over to where I am, the health director. So mm. from there, I got in touch with the health director. Okay. She gave me the prescription. That's when they started to the prescription. Because, like, what they are if my kids, I don't want them to be infected in any way. Mm. So, okay, then let me start the, the prescription. I got them myself. I asked, so what of my kids? Because yeah. it's all been in the house. And since I've not been going to work, it's all been in the house. So what happens to them? So they mm. gave me another prescription for my kids. We kept on communicating. So when will they come? Wait, they gave you another kids. prescription but for your family? Yes, I got some prescription for the kids as well. They Even though they weren't they, tested? They were, they, they had symptoms, and I said no. Okay. So they gave me some um, multivitamins that I should buy for them. Okay. All this was done on WhatsApp. Mm. So I still have part of them. So, so all through this period, no health professional came to your house? Uh, the health director gave me gave me the district and um, public health led contact that they will come and pay as a visit. So this is that and you if that will get my husband pay. So now I switch from the health director to the main. So we keep communicating. So okay. on the Sunday she was like, Oh, okay, you can go to work. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So since I don't have much uh, since I don't have any symptoms, I'm not sick. I feel okay. Mm. Like, because we keep communicating each and every day, so I okay, you can go to work. Okay. Because when they count even the 14th day, it's like Monday or uh, Sunday was the 14th day, so I said, I've gone to work. And I said, okay. I got to work on Monday. Actually, mm -hmm. I didn't even go to work purposely because I was going to work. I needed to make some payments, such as on Saturday, towards my education, my mm -hmm. school. And then the person they didn't, they didn't do the transaction for me. So like, I was here with so I went to the bank straight away to do so that issue. I just passed by the office to see what is going on. Because yeah. I'm like um, a head of my office or a head of my uh, unit. Mm. So we do been away for so long. They keep calling me. Actually, I went from home one way or the other. Because when they can get things, they can get things. They can get things. And I respond. And all that. Keep me worried that uh, what is actually going on. Can they do things in my office? And I will say a lot mm. of reports of how my submits are behaving. So I just passed by to, to make sure that everything is in order. Interesting. I went up to the same down. My daughter met me and the session for that. Okay. Come, come, come. So 
he called me outside. I actually don't know even what went to even saw my subordinates in the office. My colleagues or my junior colleagues were there. When I got I informed them that no, they shouldn't even be uh, closing the door. They should leave the door open for well, anyone who is coming to come in. Yeah. And then they should all get their face mask. I asked how we see. But I, I don't know when, when my um, junior colleagues were there. After telling them all the religion I'd help to me. But I would need to do certain things, then go back to the house. Often, wow. coming in, I don't know what he actually went to tell them in the office. Hmm. But then, what I realized was that the, the, the two family that I was on, just put on their face mask immediately. And then he called me out. Wow. Anyway. I will not, I will not be speaking. The way he spoke, I didn't like it immediately. Okay. Especially when it comes to the, uh, the, uh, the first thing they found out was the river. Actually, my result came earlier because of, like, I was in front earlier because of the relationship I have with the first director. Mm. So I started okay. taking my medication. Okay. And from the look of this, they were only told, I think, Friday or June. Anyway. All right, all right. Th thank you so much. Sweetheart, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we could go on and on about this particular issue, but then mm -hmm. she's also talking about how she was stigmatized even in her office. Her office. And uh, the fact that, you see, she's also saying that she didn't have enough money on her, and she was being asked to buy medicine, um, you know, for herself and her family, and being asked to stay at home. Whereas if she had been taken to the isolation center, maybe she won't have to necessarily pay exactly. Exactly. for it. What happens to such people? Isn't government supposed to... Uh, handle the cost? Well, I think um, the policies for that, it has to be those who work with their policies because there's nothing like that in place for those at home. Okay. If you have a treatment center or isolation center, that's a different issue altogether. But if you're home and you're being managed, the, the health professionals don't bring medicine to you? No. You have no. to buy your own yes. medicine. So the thing is, the medications that are given, actually, it's not, it's just supplements that you usually take all the time, vitamin C. And then okay. Maybe so... Usually something that you usually take, sometimes you call them and they're even already on such medications. Okay. So I'm sure that is why such conditions were normal. But those in the hospital, it goes a bit further. Okay. You put in oxygen, other medications come, which may be more expensive. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah. So moving on, I mean, what, what do we have to say? We're talking about stigmatization. Every week we touch on it and we still hear these <laughs> heartbreaking stories of people who have been stigmatized against. So, um... Well, we, we can't stop talking about it. The best we can do is continue talking about it. Let people understand that stigmatization itself is as dire as the virus. Because right now, the main thing is the stigmatization. Mm. People feel so bad because people will know they have the virus. Now, people know more about the virus. They know that, okay, they can beat it. They have to do this, they do this. Mm -hmm. But then the question comes in, how would my people treat me? How would my family treat me? How would my community treat me? Yeah. How would my workplace, how would my colleagues treat me? Are they going to accept me? Mm -hmm. Or afterwards, how are they going to behave towards me? So the best we can do is to still talk about it till people get it, that stigmatization is not supposed to be part of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. COVID already has its own issues already. Yeah. Anyway, well, <laughs> that's all time will allow. Dr. Emmanuel Amanka has been speaking to us on the need to reduce stigmatization or even get rid of it completely. And so if you're one of those people who's probably shunned someone because that person tested positive for COVID-19 and has recovered, uh, maybe you should think twice and look at how you can even show them love because COVID-19 is not a death sentence and you can protect yourself as long as you're adhering to the safety protocols. And so thank you so much. Dr. Emanuela Mankara is the lead at the Lekma Isolation Center.